Praise the Lord Jesus. We're going to read Revelation chapter 2, 12 to 17. And it says, And the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in these those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling Balak before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Amen. So, we're going to start with the first part. It says, to, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. Here, Jesus is noted, noted as having the, his own sharp sword with two edges, meaning that he has a double-edged sword, or double-edged sword. In Revelation 19.15, it says this about this sword. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp, sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Thus Jesus said himself to the church in Pergamos, though, Essentially to every church, because we can read the word of God today, and it's there included, uh, we can read what it was written, and to know that Jesus does have this sword, and this sword is still there, and it has two edges. And it says that according to Revelation 19, it comes out of his mouth. And to smite the nations, or it will smite his enemy, enemies. Thus, Jesus is the one who uses his sword for a purpose. In Revelation chapter 19, it was to smite the nations of the world. And uh, you can also use it, obviously, for a certain purpose. This is not a sword that is physical like we have on earth, uh, swords that are made, they are here on this earth, made to kill only the physical bodies of people or other, other animals. So our weapons of this life are, you know, whether they be guns, whether they be missiles, whether they be swords, whatever they may be, it's only for the purpose of destruction of the body but it does nothing, it has no power whatsoever to smite the soul. But the, the, in, However, in looking at this sword that Jesus has, and that he uses, it is a stronger, more potent weapon, and is used for a higher purpose. His sword can not only inflict the body, kill the body, but as stated in Matthew, he can with this sword also destroy both soul and body, so body and the soul. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, it says, and fear not them which kill the body, 
but are not able to kill the soul. So that's referring to the guns, referring to the missiles, referring to anything in this life. People that would use weapons to kill other people. Here, Jesus is saying to the Christians, fear not them because they only have a certain power and that is to kill the body. But, he says, are not able to kill the soul. But rather, now listen to what it says here, rather fear him which is able to destroy, to destroy both soul and body in hell. So here, the ones who fight with weapons of this life can only kill the body, but that has no power beyond. In other words, it has a power in, only in this life, but in the next it has no power power or the soul to the soul it has no power to destroy the soul and uh, but Jesus's sword the one that comes out of his mouth can destroy the body and the soul and when he does so it says here in Matthew chapter 10 28 it it can affect people and they can go to hell. Thus, the sword that Jesus has is greater than the swords or any weapons that mankind has on earth. The weapons that humanity carry or continue to prepare themselves with do not have the power to inflict death on the soul of mankind. The weapons of warfare in this li and warfare warfare in this life, such as physical weapons, and some have become so sophisticated, but the reality is they are only able to kill the body. They cannot do anything else. So they are extremely limited in scope. The sword, on the other hand, that comes out of Jesus' mouth is able to kill both soul and body, which would place a person in hell. To be killed by that sword of Jesus is to lose one's soul and be placed in hell. Thus, the best thing to do is to attend unto Jesus Christ and be on his side because he would fight against the nations and smite the nations. Therefore, it's best to be on his side. Have him become our savior and not our enemy. Follow his will, for it would be well with one's own soul. And his body. Amen. Yet, it was announced that the power of the sword or other physical weaponry, the Bible says, does not have the power in some situations to kill Amen. The soul. But there are some situations in recorded in the Bible, you know, that the sword killed the body of people, obviously, and many times in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. And Joseph and Mary, they had to leave, flee from Bethlehem because of the sword of Herod. And so they were given a warning to leave Bethlehem because Herod was after Jesus, the baby Jesus, to kill him. So they escaped out of Bethlehem and all of a sudden the sword came to Bethlehem and the sword killed the bodies of many babies. Of course, it did nothing to their souls, but it did kill their bodies. It did kill them physically speaking. So Jesus, or to um, Joseph and Mary, they had to leave quickly out of Bethlehem after a warning from God. And Herod did carry out the power of the physical sword to kill the bodies of children. But God directed them where to go, and they escaped and they were saved before disaster had struck upon them. 
So one could say that the power of the enemy is very li limited. It can only kill the body, but it has no power over the soul. And in another sense, for example, the enemy, the Satan or the devils, they do not have power to kill people. They have to influence somebody that is a human being to use something to kill somebody else or you know to, just to influence them to do it but also when it's talking about a christian the christian uh, the enemy the uh, the devil or satan has to ask permission and jesus he is a protector of our souls he's a protector also of our bodies of course, sometimes he does allow these things to happen. We all, all wonder why certain things happen to us. Why is it, Lord, do you allow these things to happen? But Jesus' sword, on the other hand, which is much greater in power, has that ability to you know, kill the body, but also the soul of mankind. So it penetrates deeper. Therefore, one should fear Jesus Christ. That is to be wise, because that is for an eternity. The body is only for this life. The soul is for eternity. So it's not to be a foolish person by not heeding his word. And having this church, and basically every church, since it became a part of the canon of Scripture, to know that Jesus is the one who carries the sword with two edges. Well, he comes out of his mouth, you could say. That means that one must beware, one must fear. The whole point why Jesus Christ mentions it is because he can and does use it. And it is for the purpose of bringing about his plan. It is also used as part of his judgment, just like the cities, for example, of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament. They were destroyed before the Lord by fire. One can imagine that God used his sword to destroy the bodies, their bodies and their souls. Further, when the Egyptian army had come after the Israelites, of course, they couldn't pass through the Red Sea. They couldn't pass on the other side. God uh, had the water come back down onto the Egyptian army, and they lost their lives. They lost their body. And that, that sword can destroy their soul as well. So God uses his sword to destroy the army's God used his sword to destroy the armies of the Egyptians. He used his sword to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And so their bodies had suffered death and their also, also their souls. In fact, <laughs> in reading Jude, Jude is the one who mentions it concerning Sodom and Gomorrah. And so, uh, here, if we look at Jude, Jude only has one chapter. And it says <clears throat> here, Jude chapter 1, verse number 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going over going after strange flesh, flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So here we have the instance of God using his sword to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in their bodies, but also their souls. So when the sword of the Lord comes around, you want to be careful because... <laughs> It can destroy not only your body, but also a person's soul. That is why we fear him above all. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
So, <clears throat> Jesus mentioned this to the church at Pergamos. He mentioned this because, you know, here was, according to Jesus, the the seat of Satan, Satan's seat, and he said that. But he wanted them to know that Satan only has power to destroy the body if he can influence someone to kill another person. And then there is a person that was named Antipas who actually died at the hands of his persecutors there in Pergamos. But remember, so Jesus is stating, the one who has two-edged sword. And so that means the body and the soul he can kill. Amen. <clears throat> so he does use it. He can use it. Amen. And uh, also Herod, he had felt the sword of the Lord upon him. In Acts chapter 12, in verse number 21, it says, And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. So here we have an inst instance where he was killed and uh, the people could not see or maybe, maybe they couldn't see the angel that came and listened to what they were shouting and the response from Herod and Jesus, of course, was giving the okay to go ahead and kill Herod. Herod had already killed James, the apostle of the Lord, but he could not, I mean, the, the enemy could not kill his soul. He only killed his body. However, here, Herod experienced the sword of the Lord, meaning the body and his soul. So, and here it also states in verse number 23, and immediately the angel of the Lord smote him. The angel of the Lord. So the angels, not only not only Jesus, but angels carry a sword that they can destroy <laughs> body and soul. So they are ones that, are fighting for the Lord. So this is the key. Jesus Christ himself has a two-edged sword that ultimately can kill both the body and the soul of mankind. Here note the angel of the Lord smote Herod, who notes that it was not just his body that died, but it also states that he was eaten of worms. That could be physical sins, but also a spiritual sins when he arrived in hell. Herod was struck by the angel of the Lord deep into his soul and not just his body. Thus the angel of the Lord, they also seemingly have swords that deliver a strike to the body and the soul of mankind, at least if they use it for that purpose. The angels are subject to Jesus Christ, so Jesus Christ is the one who must give the orders. It is most a necessity to fear Jesus Christ, the one who has that type of sword which can destroy both soul and body in hell. And so here in verse number 13, and we're reading from Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 13, it says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, 
And hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Here, the thing that Jesus Christ knows is shown. Jesus Christ knows about the martyr. He knows about the church. He knows their actions, what they do. He knows who had the doctrines of, you know, that were wrong. He knows where Satan had his seat. He knows all of these things. And so he knew about the works of the church body as a whole. And obviously the individuals of the church. So here he mentions, he knows their works as a church body, but also the work of Antipas. So as an individual and as a church body, Jesus Christ knows. He knows both collectively and individually. He knows as a collective body, the church, and that it's, you know, the works that it does to worship him, to praise him, to do things for him. And individually, the people of the church, individually, and what they do, whether they suffer or they don't suffer. And Antipas was a martyr. So this is the reason why Jesus Christ had mentioned that he holds the sword that he does because of what the enemy had inspired some people to do, to murder Antipas as a Christian martyr. The enemy only has the power when someone gives it to them by their actions. Someone had martyred Antipas, and that was the destruction of the body, but it was not the destruction of the soul. Jesus Christ had warned about this in Matthew regarding whom people should fear. The enemy, again, does not have the power to kill anyone. The only way for the enemy to try to kill someone is to get someone to agree to use the murder weapon, but the devil has no power beyond influencing someone else to do it. If no one gives him any power through their actions, he has no power to, to, to make it happen. If God does not agree to it, it will not happen either for the Christian because a Christian is under the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Secondly, the murder of someone else is only the death of the body, but it is not the death of the soul at all because humanity has no power to kill the soul, as we said before. The only one that has the power to kill the soul is the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil can only tempt, he can try to persuade to do evil, but ultimately, the judge of all humanity is Jesus Christ. He, therefore, is the one and the only one that will decide where the souls of all humanity will go, either to eternal life or eternal death. Yet, because Jesus Christ bears the sword, that means that while men are alive on earth, he can also use the sword to kill. That is, Jesus can kill why men are living, and that could be both body and soul. Here, Jesus explained to the church at Pergamos that they were living where Satan's seat was. That must have been shocking to hear. And one notes what the purpose of Satan was. It was, he was out to kill some of the Christians, persecute them, just like the devil was using Saul to persecute and kill Christians, too. The church, folks, the church folk must have known about Antipas. Jesus did too, and he called him. He called him faithful. And he named that what he had gone through, a martyr, martyrdom. He was a martyr. Even though Jesus did not live outside of Israel during the time of his ministry, he still knew all about these churches that he writes that he wants to, that he's given the message to, uh, to the Apostle John to speak to them about. And he recognizes Antipas as a martyr. So now the, the idea is, who is Antipas? Well, we had martyr, we had, a, we had read about, you know, the martyr of Stephen. And then, of course, you know, of course, we know that John the Baptist was a martyr, and Jesus was a martyr, and Stephen was a martyr in the New Testament after the day of Pentecost. But here is one that is outside the nation of Israel. So this is uh, uh, 
Antipas, and Jesus mentioned this, and, it, and um, we wouldn't have known anything about it unless Jesus mentioned to it about it. But Antipas stood up to death with his faithful belief in Jesus Christ. He did not deny him. He held to his belief in Jesus. He wouldn't deny Jesus Christ. Antipas is the first martyr we know of outside the land of Israel. He might have been the first Gentile my, martyr. Maybe he was the first Gentile martyr. So we have, you know, James was a martyr. The first, uh, the first disciple or the apostle of the Lord. And then, <clears throat> but we have Stephen, who was possibly the first martyr, at least in the Bible that we know of. And then, and uh, obviously uh, Stephen was uh, of Israel, Jewish. But Antipas, maybe he is a Gentile. So he could be the first Gentile martyr. And uh, for that reason, Jesus uh, recognizes him and it is put into the word of God. Although there were other doctrines being propagated in the church, Antipas stood faithful to the apostolic doctrine. In fact, it is announced by Jesus that there were those who held to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam. But the doctrine of the apostles is that doctrine that Antipas stood for because he was faithful to Jesus Christ. He did not give up the faith. He remained faithful to Jesus Christ in the church. Pergamus held fast to the name of Jesus Christ, but there were certain elements in there. They had different doctrines. So it is a blessing for the church to hold on to the name of Jesus Christ and the faithful doctrine of the apostles. And so there were some that had not denied the faith and did, and did not deny the name of Jesus in verse number 14 to verse number 15, it says, But I have a few things against thee. In other words, the, the church body. There are certain elements that I'm point, I am things I want to point out. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So thou hast... So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So here, uh, the doctrine of Balaam, of course, in the Old Testament, we, and we will read some of it, uh, it doesn't say what he actually taught Balak. He, he went to the mountaintop. He went there for the purpose of what Balak wanted him to do was curse Israel, but he actually turned it into a blessing. So... Even though Balaam asked the Lord, what, what should I do, you know? God told him not to go. Then later he went. And then, of course, there was a problem that he went without actually what God had told him to do. He said, if they call you, then go. But he just got up and went. In any case, um, yes, it was that, that God was angry because of that. But it was not just that. I mean, there's more to it than just him getting up and doing something that God said, well, when they call you, then go. So that was one thing that God had got angry with him. But also, here is another thing. He began to teach Balak. Of course, in, on the mountainside, when he, when he was looking towards the people of Israel, he blessed them instead of cursing them. Now, if it would have been just Balaam, he probably would have cursed them, but he had to ask God, and God gave him words to speak, which gave a blessing to Israel. Now, here in this particular part, Jesus is giving the indication, the news of what <clears throat> Balaam actually did. So we're kind of like up until Revelation, we're kind of like, thinking, well, what, what actually did this guy do? 
Uh, Peter did mention it. Jude did mention it. Here Jesus mentions it a little bit more. And it, the fact is that he mentions the fact that he was teaching. See, the word teach or taught, past tense, it says, who taught Balak. So here are things that he taught him that were contrary to righteousness. And, and that was, you know, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. <laughs> this is kind of strange. Why would he teach Balak to eat things sacrificed on idols and to commit fornication? Well, it's not that he's teaching Balak that, but he's teaching Balak to have the children, to, to get the children of Israel to do these things. Okay, so here he taught Balak, this is what you've got to do to Israel so that, you know, you can... <laughs> Kind of like win, um, even though that God had blessed Israel. Now Balaam, kind of like behind God's back, one could say, is teaching Balak what he thinks. You know, this is all according to the flesh and not the spirit of God. And then, so you know, the things that he's teaching this man is obviously not righteousness and uh, so let's go over this the, the positive things about the church Pergamos the church in Pergamos were first provided that is Jesus mentioned the positive things the negative things about them followed how big the church was is up to conjecture we don't know exactly how many that were actually holding on to this doctrine two different doctrines we don't know and whether they were teaching that doctrine in the church, we don't know, but it possibly could have been a little bit you know, said here and there, so that made Jesus mention it. Um, and this could have, should have alerted the bishop or the pastor of the church not to allow these doctrines to be taught. Maybe he just didn't know. Maybe, you know, we don't have that information. One of the things that seems interesting, to say the least, is that Jesus Christ did not speak directly to the pastor, stating that he should repent of this particular doctrine, because it seems like it was not he that had that doctrine. Amen. Um, but it was certain people within the congregation who may have, may have spread that doctrine a little bit around two different doctrines. The question would be, why were they even allowed to bring in these erroneous doctrines? And, you know, should they should they have actually gotten rid of that? Yes, Jesus is saying now, <laughs> you got to get rid of that. Repent of that. That's something that he doesn't want them to have. Jesus stated that it was more than one person within the church that had those doctrines. So where do they get that? Maybe they got it outside or whatever, or just it seemed to appear. Maybe Satan decided to, uh, uh, you know, kind of influence him in that direction, the same kind of direction that Balaam was headed. So it was uh, more than one. It says here, because thou hast them, that hold the doctrine of Balaam. So them referring to more than one within the um, body of believers. And they must also, to a certain extent, may have influenced others. So it might have been one at the beginning, but then it got to a few more. So maybe there was a, a little group of people that held to it. But they should have, no doubt, been called not to teach such a doctrine and uh, because it was not pleasing to God, obviously, to hold on to that doctrine. It was erroneous, and uh, they may have gone to the point where they had taught some of it. Jesus, obviously, was not happy 
The congregation was encouraged by Jesus Christ to get rid of these two doctrines that were erroneous and repent over those doctrines. So doctrines can lead you to you know, a certain path that is not what God wants us to go down. And so the first doctrine that was mentioned, obviously, was the doctrine of Balaam. This is not the doctrine of the apostles. It's named after a man who, in the Old Testament, had you know done some things that were angry to God about you know, that got ang God angry. And it's not one doctrine that would lead to everlasting life. This doctrine, which is called by Jesus Christ, the doctrine of Balaam was. Uh, during a moment in history, one can say, in Numbers chapter 22, it looks as though it was you know, dealing with Balak, who was a uh, person of an, uh, a leader of another nation. And this Balak asked the prophet Balaam to come and curse Israel. And uh, Balaam, obviously, would have to ask counsel of God. He would not just go ahead and uh, curse anyone without the counsel of God first. And uh, so Balaam, obviously, was ready. After God talked to him, he was kind of ready to go without waiting for the man to call him. But what does that tell you? kind of like of Balaam that tells you he was enticed to some certain degree of what Balak was actually offering or wished to give him. And he looked for more of a temporary reward of riches and honor and was memorized, mesmerized into uh, getting it. So in other words, he compromised what the Lord told him to do and you know, thinking about it overnight, he began to just kind of like say, well, you know, I think it's okay. We just go. <laughs> and so he compromised with what the Lord had really told him. And the idea of riches kind of plagued his mind. And his thoughts. He wished to get riches. He wished to get honored. You know, but he wasn't. He needs to follow the word of the Lord. But he didn't exactly. So that was a huge mistake in the beginning, but there was more to it than that. More to it than just, you know, the action of going without, you know, being, uh, without doing exactly what the Lord had told him to do. In Numbers chapter 22, 15 to 17, it says, And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they, and they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto great, very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Okay, so he was looking for honor. He was looking for riches. And, but uh, that was a problem. Numbers chapter 31, in verse number 16, it says, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So according to this verse, Balaam actually counseled against the children of Israel by having the people trespass against the Lord. In Numbers chapter 25, 1 to 9, it says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto their sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people, 
and hang them up before the Lord against the sun that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay ye every one his men that were joined in the Baal Peor. And behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Midianitish woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose up from among the congregation, took a javelin in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. So the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty, were, were twenty and four thousand people, Israelites. Amen. So, <clears throat> you know, uh, this this thing with Balaam goes a lot deeper than it looks like on the surface. It goes a lot, lot deeper. It is, of course, one action that Balaam did. He asked God. God told him exactly what to do, to wait. He didn't wait. He went ahead. And that was the first step that, you know, kind of got God angry. But then he went even further than that, you know, just totally disobeying God and then teaching Balak what to do. And then the, the Israelites did what um, Balaam had instructed Balak to instruct them. And that was to, you know, commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And then they teach them to, you know, make sacrifices unto their gods and bow down to their gods. So Israel was not doing the things, obedience unto God. And so that caused 24,000 people to lose their lives. Further, the leaders or the heads of Israel were killed <laughs> because God had told Moses to do that. Later on, Balaam, he loses his life because, you know, Moses had called Israelites to battle. They were fighting against Moab. And in that battle, later on, Balaam, he lost his life. So did Balak. So it doesn't, it doesn't help to go against God. What he wants, he wants it's, it's best to be in obedience to God. So the counsel of Balaam caused the children of Israel to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. That also led to the people going after their gods instead of Jehovah God. And then there came a plague among the people. 24,000 uh, 24, people died. The heads of the Israelites were slain before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heads of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Here the leaders of Israel were hung before the Lord. Thus they had felt, one could say, the sword of the Lord's anger. He had he was the one who influenced Moses to do this. But of course, God could have done it himself, but he influenced by speaking to Moses to do this. The Council of the ba Balaam not only caused the people to commit whoredom, but it also led to the heads of the Israelites to lose their lives. 24,000 people had lost their lives. Balaam lost his life. Balak lost his life. So it was just a mess. Thus, one could, one could question, why should one prefer riches to the obedience of the true message of salvation? I mean, you look at what Balaam did. He was prophet, you know, called a prophet. And, but this particular case, he went astray, far greater than what it appears on the surface. Uh, so sometimes people who counsel or preach the word of God prefer to get riches instead of hanging on to the truth, the apostles' doctrine. And uh, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, referred to certain false prophets or you know that would be preaching 
And that's going to cause a lot of what, like Balaam had caused, a lot of death. But, you know, and it's all for the extra riches or whatever that they are supposedly promised. But how long does it last? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12, this is where Peter mentions Balaam. It says, But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Basically, that's what happened to Balaam. He perished and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings, while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls and a heart they have exercised with covetous practice, practices, cursed children which have forsaking, forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So here it declares... Peter declares, uh, what was the problem of Balaam? He loved the wages of unrighteousness. But was rebu rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with the tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. For if, after they have, they have escaped the pollutions of the world, knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Why was it that Balaam actually counseled against Israel? What for? He did not outright curse Israel, but he did counsel against Israel. He was, according to the Apostle Peter, named as a servant of corruption. He would receive the reward of unrighteousness. His heart was exercised toward covetous practices. He had forsaken the right way of the Lord. He loved the wages of righteousness. Balaam was, according to this verse, overcome with those desires. In Jude chapter 1, uh, 10 to 13, it says, But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts and those things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withered without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Balaam here, according to Jude, ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward. What did Jesus say of those in Pergamos that, er, that adhered to this error, the same error that Balaam had? He says, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So in other words, <laughs> you got that doctrine, that the doctrine of the Balaam, doctrine of the Nicolaitans, repent, or I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And that sword, you know what kind of sword that is. There's this two-edged sword that Jesus has. He said he would use it against them. They were instructed to repent. If they decided not to repent, he would come unto them and he would fight with, against them with 
the sword. He would fight against them, the ones that are in the church that held to this doctrine. Balaam met the sword of the Lord, and he perished. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Here Jesus states to those who overcome, who overcome and obey his word to repent. He says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manner and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save saving he that receiveth it. And there is the word that Jesus said to Pergamos. And we have that today. Amen. God bless you.